Well, hey everyone, here we are with the very first AEW Collision review here on the Mr. Warren Hayes Show. Hi, I'm Mr. Warren Hayes. And uh, this is what, look, th this is what we're going to do, at least for the foreseeable future, right? And f uh, as far as Collision goes, going to do some, uh, some day after thoughts, a proper sit down review of everything that occurred on the previous night's AEW Collision. So I'm recording this on Sunday, uh, specifically on June 18, which means that we'll be talking about, of course, the first collision ever that happened on June 17, 2023. Thank you very much for being here, for watching, for listening. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, a like would be great. A subscription, if this is the first time you're here, would also be fantastic. But on top of that, if you're listening to this on your favorite audio podcast format thing, you can leave a five-star rating on Spotify, five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And again, all these things help grow the podcast tremendously. Now listen, like I said, this is the first time where the, 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 like this is the first episode that we're doing. I want to come out the gate hot, steaming hot. I want to come out here and it's like, look, this is, this is everything you need to know <laughs> about what happened last night. I'm going to give you, this is what you said should think, but we'll see how things go. Um, you know, uh, I just like, you know, pretty much I don't want to say everything in pro wrestling, but when, in a lot of circumstances, I like to come in with a with a, a good dose of optimism, and I'm optimistic that Collision is going to feel special and is going to stay special for a while. But you know, I you know I I have been burned in the past by AEW slash Tony Khan, who had once told me that AEW Rampage was not going to be a B show, and then it turned out to be a B show. So as long as Collision stays interesting, relevant, um, where there's newsworthy things happening, where uh, the matches are interesting, where there's stuff happening on it, I'll continue with this, but I reserve the right to pull the plug on this. Just, it's just like the same with my weekly Dynamite reviews, right? If, you know, if this all starts to suck shit, <laughs> well, I'm hitting the bricks. But for the time being, we're gonna we're we're gonna see how things go, and you know, at least want to catalog how things are going until things start to quote unquote suck shit. Um, but uh, but look, we 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 might as well get into it. There's there's a substantial amount of things to talk about, nonetheless. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we should just go straight ahead and start talking about it uh, about this very first collision, of course, from Chicago, Illinois, the United Center. Uh, on uh, June 17, as I previously mentioned, uh, WrestleTix um, reported that there was 9,203 tickets distributed for a setup of 10,145. Uh, didn't break the 10,000 barrier. You know, I was talking about it this week, earlier this week on, on the podcast. Um, I was like, well, you know, it, I, I, I think it would be nice if they broke this, this 10,000, uh, this 10,000, uh, uh, person, you know, number, this, this, this round number, arbitrary milestone of 10,000. I don't know why, it, like, it feels significant. Like I said, probably just because it's, it's a nice round hefty number that you can wrap your head around. But listen, uh, at 9,203. No, this isn't even close to being the sellout that the um, that the return of CM Punk was almost two years ago at this point. Uh, but it, uh, it 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 was nonetheless significant. Uh, it is nonetheless significant because this is one of their AEW's best gates for a TV event for you know for a dynamite for a collision in this in this case. So they have to be pleased with that. And, 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 and frankly, you have to perceive this as a success regardless, you know, when you consider that most shows that they do draw around half of this, maybe, you know, a little more, a little less, it fluctuates a little bit. If you want to do a median, you know, let's go with half. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and upcoming, of course, you know, th this is the story, but we're not going to get into this today. Well, you know, I talk about it enough on, on, on the podcast, but... Um, you know, I, 
I'm sure you all are in the news cycle and know that the the Canadian dates aren't drawing as well. So uh, so they have to be happy with this at least out the gate, even though it's not necessarily the the complete sellout. It's not not even necessarily. It is not the complete sellout that they were expecting it to be, not expecting it to be that they were yeah you know, without a doubt hoping it to be, but it didn't quite turn out that way. Um, besides, you know, I say expecting, but. There was no way you could recapture that that magic from 2020, uh, 2021, excuse me, when, you know, CM Punk was making his big return after being away from wrestling for seven years. The prodigal son, you know, the 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 very representation of malcontentness towards <laughs> towards the world wrestling entertainment product, uh, people dying for a mainstream alternative. Um, and, and, and there you go. There you had it. Um, so. You know, overall, like I think on a business side of things, I think it was a success. And uh, if I were to give you, let's say straight off the bat, some some general impressions about how I felt about um, uh, about Collision, I I think it. I first of all, I thought it was, I thought it was a good show. I thought it was a good solid show to to kick off. Uh, I think Collision feels different, and I that was one of my main concerns and a lot of people's concern as well. Are we just going to are we just going to end up getting Dynamite 2? I did not feel like we got Dynamite 2. As Dynamite has this breakneck kind of high speed feel to it, you know, where we're cutting from segments to segments, they've calmed down quite a bit. Like, you know, it, it, it's not as breathless as it once was where you're just like jumping from thing to thing and nothing has any time to to breathe or to sink into the audience it has improved but dynamite still has this very go 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 feel to it collision feels more poised at least this episode feels a lot more poised it's like we know what we're doing we're taking our time we don't have to stuff too much stuff <laughs> into this um you know so overall i thought the vibe was very different on that end probably helps with commentary as well being a completely different table i was thrilled to see kevin kelly getting uh, getting some do some 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 big time north american prime time television deal uh going for him congratulations and he's paired up with Ke uh, with um, nigel mcginnis uh, i was gonna say chris charlton see how that see how that's burned into my skull now but uh no he with uh, Nigel McGuinness who are going to be the, the the commentary table and Jim Ross as well we're going to talk about Jim Ross in a second but um I think uh I think Kelly and uh and Nigel just by just by creating an entirely different commentary table I think that will help set apart the product if we had had any combination of the, the regulars on Dynamite slash Rampage, Excalibur, Tony Schiavone, um, uh, uh, Taz, if we had got any combination of those on this table, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't have felt as hard of a split or uh, as hard of a change in the mood and the atmosphere, if you ask me. So I think it's a good move. Uh, you know, I know, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you know, Kevin Kelly, you know, he can't throw to picture in pictures. Listen, <laughs> this guy for the past five years has had, you know, he's been calling New Japan matches, you know, commercial lists. It's just like, you know, press record and then just let things go kind of thing. You know, it's not exactly high pressure, high broadcast timing. You know, it's like we're I am entirely comfortable in giving Kevin Kelly time to slip into these new shoes he was probably nervous despite the fact that he's a he's a pro uh i'm sure he he you know he's appreciative of the opportunity that he has here and he doesn't want to screw it up um so you know i'm i i'm i'm excited for him to to for for this role and he's going to be fantastic we just just got to give some time to grow and it's the same thing with his dynamic with nigel right i mean you know a lot of us like to think, like to say that, you know, uh, Kevin Kelly and Chris Charlton are probably the best two-man table uh, in pro wrestling. Um, but it was not that at first. Uh, if you go back, what, five years ago when they started putting Charlton on, on commentary, uh, they did not have this dynamic that they have today. It was a little more stunted, 
was a little more awkward. They had to lean into it. And now, like, these guys are unquestionably just fantastic and complement each other fantastically, and they lean into their roles excellently. You know, Kevin is the play-by-play -play guy. Uh, Chris Charlton is there for color analysis. And you couldn't have a better uh, duo than those two. We're, we're, we got to let this, we, we, we have to let this uh, grow a little bit. We have to let this go a little bit and, and see how it develops. You know, Taz and Excalibur are a lot of fun, but Taz and Excalibur didn't come out of the gate being like that either. This is chemistry, right? This is getting into the weeds. This is, you know, getting your hands dirty and going to work. This is where you see how you, how you, how you connect with your coworkers, how the chemistry is developed. So, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, there's no, I, I don't feel the obligation to sit here and criticize anyone and go like, yeah, no, no, no. not yet. <laughs> not, let's give it, let's give it a, a month or two. Then we'll talk again. Um, but I was excited. I, I, and I think it helps out a great deal. Uh, it, JR was supposed to be the third man on the table here, clearly put into an, an uh, into an analysis role. Um, and, um, and he flat out, uh, well, he flat out hurt himself <laughs> previously. And he was in, he made, you know, he made the town, uh, but he posted a, a picture of himself on social media with a big fucking black eye saying he fell. I mean, look, and, and then he got on commentary and he, and he sounded terrible. Like, I don't know what was going on. Like, I don't know what was going on. People are like, oh, he cleared his throat and wasn't so bad. So JR's been doing this for, what, 30, 40 years at this point? 50 years? Like, he knows to clear his throat before going on. Like, there was something going on. There was something uh, a, a, little, uh, a little worse. I got some, yeah, I, I got some in, um, some uh, on-location reports that people saw Kevin Kelly constantly handing JR like water and napkins and notes and whatnot. Um, look, this is a uh, look. If JR is hurt and he, and now he announced that he wants to take some time to, he's going to step away and take time to heal. If he's hurt and if he's not well, if he's uh, sick, injured, what I like, I don't know how you want to call it. Yes, please, for the love of God, take some time away and get yourself back on your feet, JR. Um, you know, and we can only hope for a speedy recovery. How that that's because it sucks. It sucks if he's if he's out like that. I'm gonna tell you. Look, the two man table. I I bring back the two man table. I have no issues with two men with, with two person tables. It's fine. We don't need too many people hanging around here. And uh, and the set. I, I like it. I like the colors. I like the scheme. Um, and again, feels entirely different than what we see on Dynamite. I think they even have red ropes for those of you who, uh, who notice the rope colors and who tend to stick on that. The ropes were red as opposed to the Dynamite black. I still prefer the black ropes. That's very personal. Black ropes seem to just disappear from your view, from your vision. It's just like, at some point, you just don't necessarily see them. You start throwing in funky colors, and it's like, well, this is all the fuck, you know, that's all you see. Anyway. But, uh, no, the look, the, the collision set, the setup, I think it's, uh, you know, it looks different, just different enough. You know, we're not, we're not uh, in the days of... Uh, you know, Raw having its own set and then SmackDown has the, you know, the fist. And we're not in those days anymore. Even WWE doesn't do that anymore. So it's fine. The shows feel different enough right now from, from the outset where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not watching like a copy-paste Dynamite as far as production goes. That's cool. I appreciate that. There's some thought, some effort put into it. As the show itself, well, let's start talking about it. And I mean, you know, this is what you have to start talking about because it's the story. It's the thing. CM Punk making his return, starting the show off with a promo. It's the big return home. The big comeback promo. He comes out. He's got shoes around his neck and a red sack. 
And he cuts. Listen. If you follow my stuff on a regular basis, you know how critical I am of this whole situation. And, you know, my... I want to make one thing clear is that my my basic views about CM Punk, you know, overall do not change. But if I'm going to sit here and provide you all with analysis of what happened last night, I'm going to give it to you fair. I'm going to give it to you objectively. And just because I'm going to sit here and tell you that he cut an absolutely fantastic promo that got me jazzed up and has me wondering a whole bunch of other things moving forward. Um... It doesn't change anything I've said over the past few months, anything I think about them, or the basic precept of it is not a question of if if CM Punk blows everything up again, it is a question of when. That still stands. That still stays. But right now, in this vacuum of a show, in what is going on here, I thought this promo was fantastic. I thought it was extremely good. Crowd, of course, is electric for it. He's in Chicago, all right, that's fine. But I, I, you know, I would wager that this is going to be one of the last times we're going to hear the audience, an audience be completely on Phil Brooks' side here. I'll get into that in a second. But look, let's get this out of the way right now, okay? Let Let's just get this completely out of the way right now. Was CM Punk shooting from the hip? Was this a shoot? And no, I do not think it was. Au contraire, I think he was absolutely... I think he he had his working boots on. You know, he had boots around his neck, you know, and he said... I'm going to, you know, whoever can fill these shoes, these boots, you know, they're more than what, but no one can or whatever. But I think he was working. And I don't think it was a work shoot. I think he was in complete work territory here. He wanted you to feel like he was walking that line. And quite frankly, there's not a lot of people who can do it like CM Punk can. There's a lot of people who will try, who will pretend. We've seen it over the past 18 months or so in AEW and in other places, of people trying to work that work shoot line, but who are unable to do it as successfully as CM Punk. And that's what I feel we had last night. He wants you to think that he's shooting, that he's, you know, oh, he's on the verge of uh, uh, of erupting. We're just about there. The geyser's about to, you know... Old Faithful's about to burst. But, no. I really do believe that he was working. And I want you to consider this. This is what, this is what I want you to consider. Have I, poured, have I poured a lot of thought into this? Yes. Have I rewatched the promo twice? Have I, take, have I taken a lot of notes? Yes, I have. Yes. Yes. I've, I've, I have probably spent... I've probably spent a little more time and not analyzing this than most people out there. <laughs> and and if you want to go ahead and call me a nerd, you're absolutely welcome to. <laughs> but then again, you know, I think this is, you know, I think this is interesting nonetheless to think about. Here, this is what I want you to consider. When thinking about whether or not this was a a, 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 a work or not. Because I, th- uh, just to clarify, I think I think it's a work. I don't think it's a work shoot. I think this was a heel promo. He's, he's saying, I'm done playing nice in his promo. He says this a couple of times. Uh, that's heel turn 101, right? Like, I mean, that, that's not even, that's not even a thing. Now, the reason why we're thinking, oh, we're, he's done playing nice, you know, it's because of all the backstage shenanigans. So for those of us who are smartened up to it, and that's a lot of us probably listening right now, um, then we're trying to, you know, we're trying to connect the dots, right? We've got our twine and our push pins on our board and we're trying to, oh, he's done playing nice, but he wasn't nice here. But I think that this is just a basic heel turn statement 
He name drops David Zaslav in his interview, the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery, one of the most hated executives in entertainment today. So when you're when you're name dropping that a guy like Zaslav who who torched Warner Brothers Discovery, right? Canceled tons of productions and, you know, fired a bunch of people. And, and, and meanwhile, you know, you've got the writer strike going on. If you're coming out name dropping Zaslav as a guy who likes you. I think we're leaning into something here. We're in we're we're cozying up to the villains. This is not unlike two weeks ago, MJF telling Adam Cole, you know what, Vince McMahon was right. It's the same level. Only Vince McMahon is much closer to wrestling fans as opposed to David Zaslav, who is, you know, maybe a maybe not not yet anyway, a a a a a, a, a figure that wrestling fans immediately associate with pro wrestling, right? Because of course he's got his, he's got his fingers in everything, uh, all sorts of entertainment properties. That's not, you know, you, you guys know what I mean. Whereas, you know, but this, I think the parallel is there nonetheless, where MJF cozies up to the ultimate villain for AEW fans in Vince McMahon and says Vince was right. You don't want to, you never want to hear that. Well, you have CM Punk coming out saying, oh, you know, David Zaslav, he thinks I'm cool. Whereas the consensus, you know, the overall opinion is David Zaslav is a piece of shit. <laughs> you know? And, 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 and he's doing this, he being CM Punk, you know, saying I'm pals with Zaslav while the strike is ongoing with the, with, with the writers. And CM Punk, you know, is a workers' rights guy? Does that ring a, any bell? You know, I don't think any of this is coincidental. Not, it is not coincidental when it comes to CM Punk. I think this is, this is all very calculated. This is a guy who, who is deliberate in what he says. I don't think this was a, this was a, a passing comment, a spur on the moment thing. I will always speak truth to power. I will always be myself. I will never compromise, is what he says. Now, again, this is something that if you're in the weeds in regards to everything that's been going on with the boy, you're like, yeah, of course, you'll never compromise. This is what got us here in the first place. But then again, you turn around, you look at this and you're like, huh, this is interesting. <laughs> this is this is very interesting. Uh, why would he? Um, uh, but why would he be bringing this up here as a good thing? I will never compromise. Then of course there's the counterfeit bucks line, right? Which a lot of people immediately clutched, clutched the, the uh, clutched their, their their pearls and held tight and like, oh no. Which I, I liked. I thought it was clever. I thought it was uh, well introduced. And if you had no idea what he was talking about. If, you're, you have no, if you have no idea what's going on backstage. And you're not privy to the news and whatnot. Then you're like, uh, you know, it's still a good line. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. I'm going to... I think because of this line here, I think we're going to get the match. I think we're good. There's, there's something deep inside me, really deep, you know, my, as I like to call it, my spidey sense. And it hasn't been, you know, I don't have a 100% hit rate with my spidey sense when it comes to works and picking up on things and but i steer y'all more in the right direction than i do the opposite don't i and i'm gonna t I, I i and I, and i don't have any proof i don't have any knowledge backstage i don't have anything 
that would lead me to believe that this is happening. But <laughs> my just by hearing that line, by listening to the entirety of this promo, I can't help but think that we are probably going to get the match. We are probably going to get, at some point, CMFTR and the Hung Bucks. I think this is more of a possibility today than it was five days ago. Just because of that line. Just because of how it con it contextualizes within this promo. And again, this is pure gut. But I sincerely believe that this was done to set a seed. I mean... <laughs> Then your brain starts turning, it, it's, you know, starts cranking out stuff. Isn't it interesting? And I'm just saying it like this. Isn't it interesting that Dynamite ended with a trios match featuring the Elite? And Collision last night finished with a trios match featuring CM Punk and FTR. Again, like, you know, poo poo on me if I'm thinking too much, if I'm breathing too much into this, right? But consider this, okay? You've got the biggest... AEW has set themselves up to have a huge summer. This is what they want. They want the summer of 2023 to be a big summer for them. Start of collision. Well, we're not quite summer yet. It's like, but you know, it's in two, three days. Who cares? Um, the start of collision, Wembley, probably, and an, you know, an all out. We're, you know, that still hasn't been confirmed, but wh what... Imagine this match happening. The biggest fucking match possible right now in AEW. You put CM Punk and Hangman Adam Page together in a ring. FTR and the Bucks. And the Bucks, you know, they also have issues with CM Punk. You put all of those guys together in a ring, you're selling out an arena. No, excuse me, a stadium in the United States of America. That's just that's just how it's how it's gonna go. That has legitimate implications. It, it was probably a shoot that they you know maybe they've all ended up being okay with it and getting into a work, and that's fine. But none of this was is accidental. The, the, what I'm saying here is that there are you know again I've got I'm privy to no information, but it makes so much sense that they would want to make this happen. And maybe, maybe this has already been cleared by everyone. Maybe everything has already been smoothed out and no one's talking about it because they want to keep the surprise. Because if you are working the smart fans and you're working them through your wrestling media contacts, right? Wouldn't you want to go as far as making sure that you shut up about everything? And not say a thing to anyone until this actually happens. Because you do not want your media contacts leaking this out. Like it is legitimately the biggest match that they can put on. This, you know, this wasn't a raw, raw, we're going to make AEW great again. Collision is going to be the place to watch pro wrestling. That wasn't his promo. It was about him. This was about CM Punk. I am a star, he says into the camera as he's walking up the ramp. What do heels cut promos on themselves? 
Sure, there was pandering to the Chicago crowd, but he will always be regional babyface CM Punk in in collision uh, in uh, in Chicago. What did he say to smart, passionate wrestling fans like everyone else here tonight? I love you for it because you love me. But he is going to he. This is probably going to be one of the last times we get a pro, a, a favorable CM Punk crowd moving forward because he has turned heel. Tonight, if you ask me, despite the fact that everything we had heard reported up until this point was indicating that he was going to uh, be a baby face to kick these this off. I saw a heel promo. I heard a heel promo. I saw a heel doing the thing here. And the sack. Look, let me pat myself on the back here. I was telling you, wouldn't it be great? If CM Punk came out with the AEW title, that's probably a thing that's going to do or he's going to come out and say, I've never been beaten for it. That's essentially what he did. He didn't use those words specifically, but that's essentially what he did with the sack and he has the AEW title in it. And don't forget, it's probably the AEW title that he has because MJF has a new belt. He made himself a custom belt. So he probably still has the title. He's probably like, yeah, no one's beating me for this. So again, we've got him and MJF which is an extraordinary match that still has to happen. And, you know, as I, as I keep saying, CM Punk owes this match to MJF. He owes him this. And he owes him lying flat on his back looking up at the stars. So this is what I got here. And, you know, been picking up, you know, I've been listening to, to, um, to, listening to some thoughts already. Uh, on 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 last night's dynamite and this is what i heard in my hunts it's not an original thought but i you know i'm gonna pass it along you know cm punk is a big bret hart guy right y'all know this right he's a big big bret hart guy loves bret all things bret well would there be anything more bret hart homage to than to replicate or to lean into, at the very least, Bret Hart's 1997 run. The run. The Stone Cold Steve Austin thing. And then, you know, the, 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 the Canada stuff. The Team Canada, the Hart Foundation. With, which is arguably one of, probably, Bret's greatest run. I would say. One of the most compelling things in pro wrestling of all time. I would say, probably, Bret's best run. Because all Brett was leaning into was his dissatisfactions, his own grumblings and 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 and, and uh, disgust at, at, at things happening around him. And then he goes to Canada, and he's an ultra babyface, right? I'm not saying CM Punk is gonna is gonna come to Toronto next week, and then everyone's gonna be up on their feet cheering for him. That's not what I'm saying. But the point of him leaning into this, being this, this heel that is teetering on the edge of being a babyface, but is just like, no, look, you know what? It's time for me to think of myself. It, there's some very Bret Hart similarities here to the 97 run. I wouldn't be offended by it. It would actually make a lot of sense when you think about it. But overall, look, I think this, look, this was a heat. This was a heel promo. Excuse me. I think there's, there's no question in that. That was a heel promo. Waters were muddied because he was in Chicago. But we are not going to be privy to a pure baby face, CM Punk, coming out, rah, 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 I'm going to work with the young guys, send Hook, all of that bullshit. No. We're getting a, we're going, we, CM Punk is going to lean into the persona that has been created for him online, or that he created for himself. You know, but, but again, let's not get into that. And that's my main takeaway. That and the fact that we are very close to a Bret Hart 97 homage with this 
with this turn moving forward. And me feeling a little more confident. Just, just a sliver more. And I'm not saying like suddenly I'm 100% certain that this is going to happen. But you got you to gotta see it for what it is here. I think there was... There was a seed planted at the very least. Not even a seed, I would say. I think, you know, the, the dirt was put in the pot. The flower pot. We're not even planting seeds yet. And are the elite already in on this? Is everyone okay with this? Great promo. I got just a great promo. EWT and T title match happened next where Luchasaurus defeated Wardlow to become the new TNT champion. This was a pretty damn average match <laughs> with a super hot crowd, though. They were they were into this. Uh, you know, we get the Swanton and a power bomb by Wardlow, but Christian Cage cracks a, a gimmick camera across Wardlow's head that allows Luchasaurus to get the win. I love the finish here where Christian is celebrating like he won. He's hoisting the title. He's on Luchasaurus' uh, shoulders. I would not be surprised we see him next week and he's, you know, he's got the title on his shoulder around his waist. You know, oh, I'm, you know, I'm carrying it for Luchasaurus, right? You know, it would be hilarious. But again, you know, you don't have to be like super on the nose about it, but it would be funny if they wanted to poke some fun at the Roman Reigns, Paul Heyman dynamic, where Paul, you know, always carries the titles around, you know, or at least one of them or whatever. But, you know, it's still all about Roman. It's all about Roman. But, you know, where, at, where it could be fun if they had some, if they, if they, if they use that just to, as parody to add a little spice here to their dynamic, where it's like, Christian is like, yeah, this is my man, you know, I'm, you know, I'm his advocate, maybe not using that word exactly, you all know what I mean, you know, using different words, but to give you the, you know, to give you the impression of that dynamic, but Christian Cage just holds on to the title and he does all the talking and I think that could be interesting. Anyway, but otherwise, yeah, the match was, you know, uh, very, very average, very, very, very average. I don't know, you know, this, uh, you know, there's always this discontent that happens, you know, it's like, oh, TNT title bouncing around. That's the first thing, you know, so who cares? It's a television title. Y'all would have been miserable. It's a television title. It's not your world title. Your world title should stay on. You, you need to make compelling top tier main event champions. That's essential, actually. A TV title is meant to be defended on TV regularly, if not every week. So, it should bounce around. If, if you go look at, the, at the, the lineage of the WCW TV title, the NWA title, TV title, uh, you don't have these 600-day reigns or whatnot, you know, these year-long reigns. That's not how it worked. That's not what it was for. That's not what this title is for either. And it's been bounced around quite a bit. There's like three guys who have like 100 plus days. Like Cody, Darby, Wardlow. I think I'm forgetting. No, Miro. Four guys. Off the top of my head. Other than that, it has been bouncing around and it should. It's fine. This is what it's for. TV title is devalued. Like if all your titles, if all your titles are treated like world titles, well, what's the point? What's the point of having a world title? What's the point of having these extended long championships? They're all right with this. I'm fine with this. And then what, uh, what are they doing with Wardlow? Well, that's, a, that's a, an interesting question. That's an interesting question. And I know that a lot of folks are looking at this saying, you know, you know they'll never get Wardlow right. And I think Wardlow's being used just fine. Does this is this an indication that he's going to be elevated? I, I don't know, elevated to what? We're going to put him in a program with MJF. 
just when we came, came out of a program that more or less didn't quite work, I mean, and I'm talking about the, the, the four pillars, are you going to go throw him in with Wardlow, which I don't think is a good idea? I don't know. Um, I think Wardlow is fine in the role that he has. Comes in a few once in a while. He tears tears some ass. Gets a, gets a title. Goes away for a bit. I think that's fine. I think it's fine. QT Marshall and Powerhouse Hobbs are interviewed backstage. Uh, they said that Hobbs was going to be on the show. They never said it was to wrestle, which I felt a little cheated out on, but I get it. That's fine. Because uh, I really did want to see Hobbs. Uh, and Hobbs inserts himself into the Owen Hart tournament. Good for him. Andrade El Idolo made his big return, defeating Buddy Matthews of the House of Black. This was a good match. What a showing by Andrade here on top of that. What a showing. And boy, he's jacked. Jack Drade is what we should call him. But this... <laughs> Jokes aside, this match was outstanding stuff. Cartwheel moonsault off the apron by Andrade Meteora by uh, Buddy Matthews. And then here's the thing. That the story in this match is that both of these guys are dealing with injuries. They're hurt, right? Buddy Murphy's knees are shot. You know, he did, does the Meteora and, and, you know, that sort of incapacitates his legs. And, and Andrade's recent surgery uh, on his shoulder, his tricep tear, becomes exploitable. All of this comes into play. I thought it was fun. To have the doctors come and check on them during the picture-in-picture. Picture because I think it fooled a lot of people into thinking they were really hurt. And again, I, like, I, can't, I can't specify enough that m you know, most of the time, most of the time, 90% of the time, if someone in the ring is actually really hurt, they're going to cut away from that person, camera-wise, and they're not going to show them on camera. So they could have done anything else. They could have cut to commentary. They could have uh, anything at all but they would have not stayed on these uh, on the person that is hurt. That's just the thing. And 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 to be f completely honest with you, I am I am slowly getting to the point where I don't want where I'm getting a little a little tired of doctors coming to check on wrestlers angles, you know, as a, you know, oh, are they really hurt? Like I'm getting a little tired of it, and I think it's going to play it's, I feel like it's starting to play itself out. I'm not, I'm not here to throw it in the bin, you know, toss it away like uh, fucking ladder matches. It's like, I don't want to see one ever again, or at least not for a while. Um, anyway, Andrade lands some dragon screws, draping DDT by Buddy Matthews. Matthews tries to do a sunset flip bomb, but you see, he lands on his knees and they buckle. He can't get his big offense off because of them. Huge running back elbow by Andrade, and I had forgotten how good of a running back elbow he did, he used to do, because that was phenomenal. That was one of his, you know, one of those where you're like, how is he not hurting people doing this, you know? But he landed it, it was great. He did the, the double moonsault thing. Knee strike by Buddy Murphy, uh, who does a standing cloverleaf, which is something that Rhea Ripley does. But then the match ends when Andrade does the figure four and transitions into a figure eight, which is something that Charlotte does. Look at these boys doing their ladies' big, big submission moves. So Andrade wins. After the match, Andrade... Uh, has a show of respect to Matthews. The lights go out, back on. House of Black are there. It's not Sabu. Brody King lays out Andrade. Malachi Black says something to him. So, La Faction Ingobernable versus House of Black. Sure, let's let's go ahead. Let, let's do anything at this point. Let's let, let's. That sounds like fun. So. The big return for Andrade, I think he looked like a superstar here. Uh, he looks great. He acted great too. He acted in the sense that, not acted, that was a weird way to put it. He wrestled really well. He was really good. I thought he was very, very good. Motivated, dare I say. And I think this is, uh, this is the story of a lot of a couple of people here tonight, which I'm going to talk about very, very shortly as well. Um, motivation. And motivation does, you know, 
count for a lot when it comes to uh, when it comes to how hard these people are going to work. Uh, yes, you know we heard all the malcontent stuff and you know the you know the 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 angry tweeting and the you know all the nonsense. You know, heard all of it, but I, I you know I can't tell you that Andrade was half assing it tonight. He absolutely was not. He's no fool. He's not an idiot. He knows what's going on here, and he's probably in the best possible position he's been in since joining AEW. This is absolutely his best match in AEW, and you know what? I'd go as far as to say this was Buddy Matthews' best match in AEW so far, so what are we complaining about? You know, it's an interesting... Maybe it's because I've been watching wrestling for so long, and I've been, you know, privy to wrestling news and wrestlers, you know, bitching about things for, for decades at this point. All wrestlers complain. All wrestlers bitch. None of them are happy because of their positioning on the card. None of them are. You're bi- un- un- unless you are a top guy, and even so, then the top guys it becomes a whole other different bag of a, a whole of the different can of worms. But no one is happy with their position on the card because everyone thinks they should main event. It sh- that's pretty much it. So. Th- Andrade being unhappy with what how he's been handled, I was it annoying for a while? I guess, sure, sure. You know, I didn't pay much much mind to it because like ah, it's Andrade. He wasn't happy in WWE either, and he was doing that as well. He's doing it here now. He did it everywhere. And it's kind of a thing, you know, for the, you know, there's also you know, it's kind of a thing for him that we've seen multiple times. I'm like, okay. But if he comes out and he's happy, ultimately that's what matters. If I sit down to watch a wrestling a wrestling program and I see this guy come out and he puts on a hell of a show for me, what what more do I want? Uh, complain some more, brother. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, ultimately it doesn't matter if he's coming out and he's putting on great matches. Now we can have this discussion maybe down the line if he starts complaining. You know, he doesn't want to put the effort in because he's not a world champion. That's a whole other. That's a whole other nine yards kind of situation here, but I didn't think he was particularly well used um, on Dynamite previously, and you know I know a lot of people turned on him, you know fans and whatnot. But look, this guy reminded us how great he is, how fucking great he is. Is his ceiling world champion? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. I personally, I don't think so. But I think he's an upper tier guy. I think he's a guy you get invested in. I think it's a guy who can come in and steal a show. Absolutely. Why? Because we've seen it done. We've seen him do it before in other circumstances and other promotions. And now he he looks jacked. He looks tremendous. He doesn't look to be going any slower. We're ready for. I'm ready for this next phase of Andrade. I'm excited for it. We get a hype reel for Scorpio Sky's return. Am I going to be alone in here saying that this is a make it or break it moment for Scorp? I feel like it. I, I, this is how I mean, that's how I feel about it. Because this guy's got had multiple chances, right? He's had multiple, multiple, multiple chances at. And pushes, pushes, tag team champion, TNT champion. And it's not that he's untalented. I don't think he's a dud. But I kind of feel like this is a make it or break it for him now. If that makes sense. Miro defeated Tony Nese. Tony Nese is in the ring. He's uh, with Mark Sterling. He's calling the people in the audience fat. Because he's a personal trainer and he finds them offensive. That's great stuff. What it, just get some heat going. Make sure people know who to boo. Because when Miro comes out, you want people to cheer. That was the plan. And Miro comes out, looks fantastic. As he always does. Gets a fun little enhancement match. People are calling it a squash. I wouldn't call it a squash. A squash for me is, I don't know. A squash for me is shorter. 
or, you know, last this long with complete domination, but, you know, Nice was fleeing and, you know, there was stuff around the ring. And, like, a dominant enhancement match for Miro, unquestionably. And, you know, they hyped Miro's return tremendously. Miro coming up next. Miro, you know, Miro, Miro. Miro. So there's plans for him. Now, Miro is a guy whose ceiling I see is world champion. He's a guy you could throw into the mix. Now, is that what they're going to do? That's a whole other That's a whole other nine yards. But there's another guy. But this is a guy that it's very strange. And I, you know, this is another guy who probably got into his own way because he was getting a great push. He, the, the Redeemer stuff was universally acclaimed. Fans loved it. Weirdos like me loved it. We, we were all, you know, we were all in agreement that the Redeemer promos were excellent week after week. His push was great. And then all of a sudden, just like, poof, it disappeared. So something happened. And then, yes, you have, you know, CJ Perry hitting the circuit and saying, oh, you know, Tony Khan isn't returning calls, whatever she was saying, you know, I was like, what, what are you doing? What, what is this? And then, you know, the little subtle hints that, oh, maybe we'll go back to WWE. Isn't WWE great? They had so much more stories for me to do and all that bullshit. And you're like, you know, just piling on a situation where you're like, you probably don't need to pile on here. It didn't matter. But look, if, if, if in two extra hours of professional wrestling in a week, we can get Miro back on track, I'm okay with it. I'm absolutely fine with this. And there's a lot that you can do with Miro because he hasn't done that much. There are still oodles of fresh matches for him in this situation here. And they're clearly positioning him as a babyface, so there you go. I was excited to see him come back. Again, he looked motivated. He l That's the thing. And you can, and listen, same with Andrade. You can absolutely tell me, Warren, but what is going to happen when they become unmotivated? Well, if they become unmotivated again. Well, okay. If they become unmotivated and they stop, you know, and they stop working like this, uh, pull them off TV. For whatever reason, look, at some point, right, they have to go and do the work. They have to do the job. You know, I, I'm no huge fan of Roosh and his own personal attitude, but... It is difficult to say that that guy doesn't, hasn't been delivering, over-delivering, since arriving in AEW. Because he's motivated. So give me the motivated wrestlers. Absolutely. And if, you're, you know, if your wrestlers are starting to slouch because they're like, eh, well, I'm going to go out and put a half, you know, a two and a half star match. Like, well, tell them to hit the bricks. We've got no time for that. You got, Tony's got a boss up here. Then we get a promo package for CM Punk who said, uh, you know, it was basically rehashing the the, the pre-tape that they did earlier. Um, lots of promoting the main event tonight throughout Dynamite. Had, did you notice? Uh, throughout Collision, excuse me. Did you notice? It's something they don't usually do on Dynamite. But, you know, over and over, it happened frequently. Oh, have, you know. Don't forget tonight, the main event. The main event coming up next. And I was like, well, the main event coming up next. You do that, right? But later on tonight, later on tonight. And then you do, you had that promo package and then you had one. You know, look, all sorts of stuff happening to promote the main event. Sky Blue and Willow Nightingale defeat the Outcasts. Fun little match. I enjoyed it. Ruby hits a barricade spot early in the match and boy, does she hit hard. She really ran ran into the the barricade hard here. Great heat segment by the heels here. I thought everyone I thought everyone looked very good in this match. Tony Storm continues to be the workhorse of the women's division. This is a narrative I've been carrying, been carrying for a while. Orange Cassidy, workhorse. He's on every week. He's doing everything. Tony Storm. She's been undeniably great. She's back as champion. And, and she's been on TV and she's been doing fantastic stuff. Like if you could not have picked a better person to sub, to sub in for uh, Jamie Hayter than Tony Storm. For real. This is, uh, this is fantastic stuff. The spray cans get involved again. But you know, anyway, 
The baby faces have some too. Go watch it if you want the breakdown of this. <laughs> Death Valley Driver by Willow Nightingale and a Cold Blue by uh, 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 by uh, Sky Blue for the win in front of a Chicago crowd. Of course, this was this was the thing. This was going to happen. Um, good performance, and again, another good showing by by Sky Blue. Um, and uh, you know, I I I know there's a lot of people who are. So incredibly high on Sky Blue now saying she's great, she's fantastic, push her, push her, push her. And I would invite everyone to just very, very put your feelings aside on however she looks and her 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 and her complete natural charisma, right? And her clear wrestling ability. I think she's been improving for a time. I thought she was slouching. Now I think she's back on a level where I see improvement. And where I can see, you know, a direction for her. Because there's still a lot of work for her to do. She's not a finished product. And sometimes I feel like when we get really excited about a young prospect, we start going, they're fantastic. Push them now. This now the time. And, or we overstate how good they are because we're just excited. And that's fine to be excited. And then when they do improve, when they do really get better, because we were so excited from the get-go and we we're saying, you know, oh, they're great, they're amazing, they're fantastic. When they finally do improve and they become undeniable and a great wrestler, then everything sort of feels a little softer, right? Then you're like, well, maybe, you know, it's not as impactful. And I think we should very gently and extremely with respect pump the brakes on the Sky Blue is great discourse she is very good and she's got lots of she's got lots of talent but she we have to just be cognizant of the fact that she's an unfinished product and again this is not me saying she stinks because she does not she absolutely does not and she's recently been showing lots of glimmers lots of very uh, uh, clear moments of brilliance where you're like all right, all right, we're, we're, we're on to something here still. We were on to something when she was signed, uh, when, when she started doing AEW stuff, a few, you know, what, 18 months ago? I don't remember. And, but you could always tell, oh, well, you know, still very much a rookie, still very much a rookie. Now, I feel we're, we're, we're she's, she's molding herself into something that is, uh, that is ready for primetime television. I think she still she still lacks. For instance, I still think she lacks crowd connection. I think that's still her. I've been consistent on this. I think this is one of her main problems. You have someone like Willow Nightingale who comes out, who has that immediate connection with the audience, who knows how to play to them, who gets the crowd invested in her persona, and then you have Sky Blue who is still very, I don't know, like she's not confident. She doesn't exude that kind of confidence, that kind of persona. That connects with the audience. She's still, she, you know, the way she she gets the crowd hyped up is with very gener generic wrestler reactions. You know, it's like, let's go. You know, and she's not looking at the audience. She's sort of looking down at the ring. You know, it's, it's little things like that. But eventually, she will get the confidence. She will get the, the that connection because she has a, a natural charisma about her that people would murder for. And all she needs to do is lean into a connection with the audience. That's all she needs to do. And I'm saying this as if this is easy. She has to figure out how to do it. She has to figure out so that it, it, it feels right for herself. And that's okay. Do I like Sky Blue? Yes. Tremendously. Does she have tremendous upside? Absolutely. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you she's the greatest woman in the women's division, push her, give it the title. Absolutely not. That would be doing her a disservice more than anything else. You know, the kind of thing that I, that I, that I tell that, um, that annoys me with NXT when they belt up people who might not be ready for that spot. I'm telling you to do the opposite here. Don't do it. It's not because... One one side does it, and it doesn't exactly turn out, you know, golden. 
It's fine. So, you know, I'm far from being a hater. I think I'm just being a realist here. I like her, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm here for it. I'm here for the road to it. That's not to say that I'm dismissing her. Au contraire. This is what, this should also be part of everyone's fandom to just be able to sit down and be like, I'm excited to see the road that this person is going to take. I'm seeing this person at the, at, from the onset of their career. You know, I'm not jumping in here with wrestlers who have been doing this for, you know, and seeing only wrestlers that have been doing this for 15, 20, 25 years. I'm watching a wrestler here develop before my very eyes, so I'm excited to see the route that they're going to take. And they don't have to be fast-tracked. We can take our time and give us a full finished product that will be compelling. So it's like, like I said, you know, you the compare and contrast with Willow, especially since they were on the same tag team, is 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 nuts. Willow is absolutely, you know, a complete package, and she's just been tweaking her presentation to live North American television crowds. That's what she's been doing, and she's been succeeding because. She gets enormous reactions every time. Everybody fucking loves Willow Nightingale. Plus, on top of that, she's a great wrestler. I mean, if you were to get, if you were to tell me the main event of All Out 2023 for the women is going to be Tony Storm versus Willow Nightingale, I'm I'm 100 into that because of the personas, because of the the personalities involved, and the work. The work is going to be great. I have no qualms with that. Fun little match for <laughs> coming back to collision. Went off on a on a bit of a sidebar there, but fun match. We get a Ricky Starks pre-tape where he is officially declaring himself for the Owen Hart tournament. Out the gate, I think he's my favorite to win. We also get a pre-tape of Jeff Jarrett, who's challenging Mark Briscoe to a concession stand brawl this week on Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be fun as hell uh, it's going to be fun as hell the acclaimed hit the ring we get a rah-rah speech from them they're out with daddy ass it's father's day so on and so forth the crowd is into them basically they said they're going to be working both collision and dynamite <clears throat> that's the takeaway here um uh, Essentially confirming that there's not going to be this hard roster split. Um, and who cares? Like, for, well, hang on. Let me say that again. I do care. And I think this is the best way to go about it. Don't create these arbitrary rules for yourself. Where it's like, it has to be, it has to be this, absolutely. You cannot go to Dynamite because, let's not do that because... It's annoying when you do start switching people around. It's just annoying. And it makes it less important than when it should be. So don't do any hard roster splits. I'm glad that they came out like and addressed it in a very kayfabe storyline way where it's like, oh, we're going to be bouncing back and forth. Which basically establishes the fact that the only person who is truly consigned to collision is CM Punk. He's the only guy. It's his show. And he's the only guy who is going to be molded into the cement of that program. And everyone else can still jump around. Let's go. That's fine. Now, does this mean less time for certain people? Does this mean that we are going to see, you know, always the risk of these things happening? Are you, we going to be seeing more of certain people on both shows? You know, we were already seeing them a ton on one show. Are we going to see them as well on the other show? Thereby taking away some screen time from people who aren't getting as much screen time. Possibly. But you know what? AEW's major concern, first concern, is ratings. It's getting people to buy tickets. So if this means having more Blackpool Combat Club on both shows, let's... All right. If that means more... Uh, more of the same women acts. Okay. Like that's the main concern. Do I agree with it? That's a whole other different discussion. I think I th I think if you're adding two hours of programming per week, we should be getting a more diverse act. We should be getting more diverse access to the roster. 
to the 150 some dudes that you have on just, and we're just talking the dudes, right? 120, 130, I don't remember what they're at now. Should be getting more access to those people and deepening your women's roster at the same time because you're adding two extra hours a week. So, you know. Yeah, that's my, you know, overall, that's my thought. <laughs> but like I said, you know, eventually AEW's, um, AEW's first uh, 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 and uh, 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 concern is to get this into the hands of, um, is to get this into the hands of, uh, is to make sure that there are more people watching, more people buying tickets. So if that means more people, more of the same draws on both shows, well, there you go. You, 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 can't, you, you can't defeat that logic either. And then it was announced that on Dynamite, we're going to be getting a blind eliminator tag team tournament. Weren't announced. We don't know what that means. Are they going to be drawing names? Are they going to, is it just going to be a thing where a tag team start, the, like the tag teams don't know who their opponents are going to be? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and finally, the main event. Where CMFTR defeated the team of Samoa Joe and Bullet Club Gold. I really liked this main event. I thought it was very good. 25 minute main event on top of that. I think most everyone worked really hard. <laughs> if you watch the match, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but this was great. This was great. Um, and it really felt, it felt, um, it felt like we're setting things up. We're establishing a power dynamic. I found Dax Harwood and Jay White worked their asses off in this match. Dax looked fantastic. So did Jay. Yeah, and honestly, like it's, and I'm not even saying that like I'm surprised. Do a guy like Jay White sees this opportunity? You think he's gonna phone it in? No, no, we got some, we got some pristine Jay White here. I'll tell you what. The CM Punk Samoa Joe stuff worked and it was electric and the crowd was into it and the guys were into it. This all worked. Joe was in top form on top of that. Complete stalking monster Resident Evil 3 nemesis mode. He was he was just like coming in and beating the shit out of people, chops, kawada kicks, like Dax ate shit in this match. Powerplex elbow drop. Um, combination by CMFTR. Joe has Punk in his sleeper. Blood Club Gold are holding off FTR, but then Cash escapes. And this was, I, I can't, I kind of laughed. Because he was, Cash was at the far left hand of the, of the ring. Dax was being held on the right side and Joe had CM Punk in the middle. And CM Punk was, and those were the legal guys, right? So Cash runs all the way past <laughs> Joe and CM Punk to free Dax first and then they come and free up CM Punk. Now, I don't know if they're going to lean into that, but I thought that was really funny. But uh, CM Punk in this match was definitely the guy who got the least amount of work in. I thought it was very... And look, you know, he... I will echo... Oh, you know, a lot of thoughts. I don't think he looked particularly fit or great. Uh, he kind of looked like a guy. You know, I just a guy. But the minute this guy opens his mouth, and that's his thing, right? That's the, that's his unbridled, you know, electric ch charisma. That's where everything comes comes together. But in the ring, as I saw him going around, I said, "Man," and it's not that CM Punk has ever been a body guy. Don't get me wrong, but it was just striking. It was a little striking. And, you know, he really didn't put much effort into the match either. He got his spots in and that was pretty much it. But, uh, you know, if they're going to put him in storage like they did with Danielson, it's smart. Pull him out for the big matches so that he doesn't hurt himself in the meantime. I mean, everything he did was very safe. 
Not that he couldn't have gotten hurt on, you know, diving elbows and whatnot, but everything was very safe. He didn't do anything insane. I don't think you should have expected him to do that. This was one of the reasons we put the, the, the six man was put together was to help, you know, smoke and mirror stuff. I ain't even called it as well. This was to smoke and mirror a lot of stuff. Make sure CM Punk didn't have to work the entirety of the match. Let everyone else do the heavy lifting. This this is good. And if we're if we're setting if we're setting the table for CM Punk versus Samoa Joe, well, this is very interesting. I thought this was very good and got me more excited for it than I would have imagined previously. This match worked. This was a great trios match. I got the, those, those are my thoughts. I thought it was electric. I thought everyone worked really hard. This is an upper tier, great, great main event. I liked it. I thought the show kept off perfectly. And I'm excited for Collision next week. Yeah, I am. I'm ready for it. My body is ready for it, as the kids like to say. But again, I can't help but wonder. Dynamite ends with the Bucks and Hangman and Collision ends with CM Punk and FTR. I, again, it's very, I, I, I know it's very conspiracy theory-ish, but I can't help but wonder. So there you have it. Those are my thoughts on the very first Collision. I thought it was a good show. Solid, well put together, good stuff. We'll see what happens with this moving forward, but I'll be back next week for another Collision Review. But even in the meantime, I'm going to be back on Tuesday for another edition of the Mr. Warren Hayes Show proper. It's going to be the, the Forbidden Door Preview Show. I'm excited to do that, so be sure to you, you check that out. And, uh, and of course, we'll be back on Thursday as well for the weekly Dynamite Review. So if you haven't already, leave a like and, a sub and, and subscribe to the YouTube channel or leave some reviews and ratings on your favorite podcast app of choice. Hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. And I'll see you next time.